Jeff Salzenstein was a top-ranked junior player and two-year All-American at Stanford. He reached a high ranking of 100 in the world, and despite not being a, known as a big server, he reached his goal of serving over 130 miles per hour by the age of 30, and today is known as an expert on serve technique. He is now the CEO of Tennis Evolution, an online learning platform that blends high-level tennis technique with an easy-to-understand approach. He is a much sought-after speaker, and we are honored to have him today. Hey, Jeff. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, what's, our, what's our time frame for this call? I mean, for this presentation? Jeff, it's an hour, but we also, since you're last, if you're uh, rocking and rolling with us, you, uh, you've got some extra time and we'll all stay and listen. Sure. So, you know, my plan is to go for about 45 minutes. So this is perfect. I can open up the, the remaining time for, for question and answer and we'll see how that evolves, but I, I can definitely make myself available. So uh, really excited to bring this presentation uh, to all of you. And what we're going to do today, I'm going to, I'm going to dance between a PowerPoint slide. I've got some slides to share and then really I'm just going to open up my laptop and show some case studies of, of serves and video analysis and hopefully give you all a framework uh, to, to look at uh, a possibility. If you have questions about how you're teaching the serve, how as a tennis community, we could teach the serve and help people get, uh, serve better so they can get more satisfaction and more enjoyment out of the game. So I am going to share my screen here. So yes, this is a serve video analysis masterclass. I'd love to give you an inside look at what I've been doing over the last decade and also bring in some of the experience and knowledge that I learned from, from past mentors as I was playing on the tour on my search uh, and so the title of this presentation is Serve Video Analysis Masterclass, Building Your Players from the, from the Ground Up. And let's see here. Here we go. Okay. So what I'm hoping from this 45-minute presentation is for some of you, maybe all of you, we'll see, that you have a paradigm shift, that you look at the serve and you look at how to teach the serve and how to impact your players in a different way. Uh, that would be my goal. And that there'd be one takeaway that a light bulb would go off and say, Hey, wow, I I'm looking at the serve in a different way than I ever have before. And so the quote that I'd like to start with is if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so the whole idea is if we can change the way that we look at serving and the challenges that we have with teaching the serve, and we can give our, our players a bigger impact by being able to serve better. They'll play better tennis. Maybe they'll want to play more tennis. We can even grow the game. So it's not, for me, this is not just about teaching the serve. This goes a lot deeper uh, and how we know that the serve is the most difficult shot in tennis and a lot of players struggle with it. If we can give them a result, they're going to get jazzed, jazzed about playing even more tennis. And so I, I'm bringing the question uh, to all those, those that will listen to me, uh, how do we actually teach the serve? What are some of the ways that we've taught it in the past? And could we challenge that? Could we challenge the way the serve has been taught for the last hundred years and actually start to teach it a different way? So how we teach our students, it's, it's going to change. It is changing. Obviously, COVID, COVID has accelerated this process. We're on an online, we're doing an online seminar now instead of meeting in person. So the ability to get on the court and help a player with their serve, but also to use technology and to use video technology and to do it in a very effective way uh, is something that I'm very passionate about. And so... The things that I want to discuss today, there's, there's three P's. So I already mentioned the, well, there's four P's. The first P was the paradigm shift, but the three P's that I want to really talk about today when we get into these case studies are number one, patterns. That if you start to look at the serve, you can start to see specific patterns in the way that players are moving, in the way that they're swinging the racket. And you all are experienced coaches, so you've probably seen patterns over the years over and over again the same things that are consistent and for me i've noticed that over the years and i'd like to share how again how i look at the serve and how i think we can make uh, instruction more efficient uh, and using video analysis to do so so patterns is the one p the second p is positions so looking at the different positions 
that players get into when they serve. The most obvious position is the trophy position. We know that most players struggle with finding that position for whatever reason, whether it's their grip or how they move the rack at the beginning of the motion, uh, how they bend their knees, the stance they're in. So looking at specific positions in the serve and seeing how we can get people to get into better positions. And finally, progressions. I think that as a community uh, of tennis coaches, I think that we could really improve how we go about systematic progressions to help players serve. And this is not uh, necessarily the fault of the coaches. I think there's a, um, there's a way that we are teaching the serve where we're skipping steps. And many players, when they start the game, they want to just play. They pick up the rack, racket. They start playing points. They want to have fun playing points. Uh, but there's so much more to the serve and to learning to serve. And we skip over steps. We have players step, uh, get on the baseline, toss the ball and hit the serve with their old habits, but it's going to be difficult for them to change their serve or actually look more like the pros unless they go through specific progressions. I also want to mention the body serve connection. So we're going to talk about the body today and I'm affiliated with racket fit. And if you're not familiar with racket fit, basically they came from golf uh, TPI is the Titleist Performance Institute. And what they did is they made the connection between the golf swing and the body. And if you have limitations, if you have a lack of stability or mobility in specific areas of the body, that will impact your serve technique. So it's not enough just to help our players to uh, help them, you know, get the toss in the right place or turn their shoulders uh, more. They have to be able to actually physically do it. And what you're probably seeing is a lot of, especially your older players, are unable to get in the positions that Roger Federer can get into. And so we have to take a more holistic view and say, wow, maybe they don't have the ankle mobility or the hip mobility to get into these positions. So we have to figure out a way how we can help them with that if they're interested. And so there are three questions that I want you to all to consider as I jump into these case studies. Uh, <laughs> The first one is what is the upper body doing or what is the arm doing? What is the racket doing throughout the motion? Paying attention to that. What is the lower body doing? What are the legs doing? What does the stance look like? What adjustments can be made there? And then as I alluded to earlier with the racket fit concept, can the body actually do it? So these are the three questions I keep asking myself every time I look at someone that's serving, I look at what the upper body is doing what the lower body is doing, and can the body actually do it? So with that being said, I've got a quick story uh, before we get into these case studies. Uh, it was talked about in the summary introducing me, uh, Goran Ivanisevic here at Wimbledon. I'm 19 years old. I'm playing number five singles for Stanford. I'm a grinder. Uh, I don't have a serve weapon. I'm not breaking 100 miles an hour. I'm double faulting a lot. My toss is really high. I have a pinpoint stance. My rhythm is off. And it was a huge struggle. And one summer between my freshman and sophomore year, I studied Goran Ivanisevic. This was before YouTube and video analysis. And I watched him on TV. And he was a lefty. And I'm a lefty. And then I went out the on the court and started uh, modeling him. It's just like that, you know, being able to model a player and pretend like you're them and something clicked and I was able to add 20 miles an hour to my serve. And that was my first breakthrough where I actually turned my serve from a liability into a weapon. And it was through the power of modeling. And just four years after that, or three years after that, I found myself playing at the French open, playing uh, on a, a night match at the U S open against Michael Chang. And you know, that, it's pretty impactful to me to, to go through a serve transformation and, and literally change the trajectory of my life and my career. I was on a path to graduate from Stanford and then get a real job. And because I developed my serve, I was able to play on the tour for 11 years. And I look at players around the country and around the world and I think, wow, if they could improve their serve and they had a way to do it, uh, they could ascend to higher levels and they could get more enjoyment out of the game, wherever their level is at, whether they're 3-0, 3-5, 4-0, college player, pro, it doesn't matter. Really diving into how to help someone serve better can make a huge difference in their tennis experience. And when I was 28, uh, I modeled uh, Pete Sampras. I couldn't get into as an extreme position as he could, 
but I, at 28 years old, I was still on the journey and I worked with John Yandel. And so that was a huge, um, that was a huge shift. I switched from a pinpoint to a platform and that allowed me to break the top hundred when I was 30. I started serving more efficiently and John helping me there. So now that I'm coaching, uh, you might say, well, Jeff, you've had tennis evolution for a decade now. You're, you're, you're a master at technology. You understand online videos, all that good stuff. I can tell you today, I still have never used Dartfish. I have never used, I've used Coach's Eye a little bit. I ended up buying a software called uh, soft, uh, ScreenFlow. I paid a hundred bucks for it. And I do most of my video analysis still on my laptop. So I'm not even uh, as advanced with the video analysis that I could be, but I'm still working it. I'm still uh, able to impact people with the technology that I set up. So I don't want you to feel like if you're technologically challenged that you can't do this. You can't start using video in a more efficient way. And a lot of times I just use my iPhone, take the video on the phone, uh, on the court, um, take, I'm watching them serve and I go through it with them and right on the court, right there with no technology, no apps. It's just a video of them and I show them the different positions. The, on the left here, this is a player, a college player, division one college player. And uh, I want you to pay attention to his lower body, particularly his stance. So he's in a platform stance, platform meaning that he's not moving his back foot. And again, that looks pretty good. After one video analysis, never met him in person. We did a coaching call like this. I showed him what was going on. I compared it to Federer and I'm gonna pull up. I'll actually pull up Federer here as well. See if I can, let's give me a minute here. Okay. So we moved, what we did is we moved, we moved his uh, right foot back. So if you can see the distance between the toe of the back foot and the heel of the front foot, the, the video on the left, this was the before, he, he was in line with the heel of his foot. And you'll see that with a lot of players. They might even have their toe in line with the midfoot. And what we did is we slid this foot back to the left and we also externally rotated or opened up the back foot. And if you do that with a player, and again, keep in mind, this is an advanced player. They have a continental grip. Don't do this if they have a forehand grip. That's a whole nother kettle of fish. But uh, moving this foot back, look at the amount of turn that he just got by making that one change. And so I feel like we can help players with their shoulder turn, with their upper body, if we improve their stance. And it has nothing to do with technique. It does in terms of how they swing the racket, how they toss the ball just by sliding the foot a little bit more to the left. And this is going to vary for different players. Okay. Every, every player is not going to be able to slide it back to the left that much. He got into the position that worked for him, but this is a stark contrast in my opinion uh, from someone who simply just slid. So this is what we did. We slid the foot back to the left and we externally rotated the foot. And the question was asked, is it just this player? What I'm finding, and I'm going to show you a few more examples here. What I'm finding is if you do this one stance hack, even if you can just slide a player back a half an inch or an inch, even if you can open up their back foot, again, provided they have a continental grip, if they have a forehand grip, all things are off. Uh, you probably would have to move this foot so that it is more in line with the back foot because you're not going to be able to turn this much. This is contingent on a continental grip. But this is across the board. If you want to help someone with shoulder turn and hip rotation, then you're, go you're going to use that. Uh, uh, you're going to use that tip to get the person to be able to uh, turn more and rotate more. So that's a very powerful uh, tip right off the bat. We haven't even we haven't talked about toss position. We haven't talked about using the legs. We haven't talked about keeping the head up. All of the more common uh, tips that we give players. This one sets the stage and the foundation. And so I would say that 90% of the time, 95% of the time, if I do a video analysis, I am coaching them on their stance. And so I want to show another example. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do, it looks like the side by side, but this is when he came to me. Can you, can you see this player? Yes. Okay. 
So this player came to me three years ago after a video analysis, and I want you to notice his stance here. Again, looks pretty good. He's in a, in a pinpoint stance. I'm sorry, a platform stance, meaning he's not going to move his back foot. He's in a pretty good position. But when he brings the rackets up, you can see there's not a lot of turn at the beginning of the motion. And we're going to get into the upper body in a moment. So this was a bad toss by him. We're going to go again. Okay, so not a lot of turn here with his upper body. And he finally finds his turn there a little bit later, tosses on the higher side. Now, let's fast forward a couple years. I'm gonna have to jerry-rig this now. We're just adjusting on the fly. Now, this is the serve current. And he went extreme as well by moving he basically, he basically moved the foot back a little bit to the left, but he really is externally rotating his back leg. I think he does it too much personally. But again, what this allows him to do is as he's tossing the ball, he gets massive turn. Now, this is a player that's gone from a guy who wasn't winning matches in futures to um, now he's beating guys top 200 in the world. He's about 450 in the world now, but he's actually playing top 200 tennis. And he specifically says it's the serve that – took me from 900 in the world to the top, to a top 200 level. Yes, he's improved other aspects of his game, but this is the single biggest change. And if you really break it down, you say, well, he, he changed his stance and he changed this. He got into a much better position, a la Sampras, McEnroe, even more extreme than, than Federer. So uh, another example. We will go to a female player. Normally I'm just sharing my whole screen and I'm just bringing it up. So apologize for that. All right. So this is a player I'm going to show you with a, with a pinpoint stance. And obviously there's a lot of players out there you see that are moving their back foot. And this was a couple of years ago as well. So she is tossing the ball. She looks like she's in a pretty good stance here. And then as she tosses the ball, she brings her back foot up. Now, you'll see this a lot. You'll even see players bring that back foot up uh, to the right of, the, of their front foot. And that will limit coil and turn as well. You can see here again, she's really using her legs, but she's not really coiling or turning like the other two players that we just showed you. So this was her serve a few years ago. And by the way, and I'm going to show you an example, I'm not against the pinpoint stance. I would just like players to bring their back foot up into a different position than the ones that I normally see where it really limits turn. And there are great pro players out there that have a pinpoint stance that also have a good turn. So it's not like you can't do it, but I see at the, at the club level and the junior level, I see players struggling with this concept. And that's why, that's why we're talking about it today. So I'm going to bring up the after. And so really the playback book I'm using, if you want to say, if you can see her from the back view, the playbook I'm using is more of this Sampras Federer mold because I believe they have the most efficient serves. I don't try to make them look like Federer or look like Sampras what I try to do is get players in better positions. Like we talked about earlier, we want a better position uh, for them to be at because I've seen these same patterns over and over again, a lack of turn, a lack of coil, uh, the inability to use the hips and load and push off properly. So if I set the foundation and get players into a great stance, then the, the rest of the serve can start to naturally develop. So you can see here again, her back foot has slid back. She's in a, she's in a, uh, platform stance and she has a much better turn now than than she ever has uh, had before and she could turn this back foot out a little bit more but again this this whole idea is that getting the feet in the right position will allow her to turn her upper body easier if you don't do this then you're going to feel a block in that back hip this is this is me uh recently I want to show you a side view. Sometimes I like to demo for players, but you can see again, look at that back leg. 
uh, back foot, how it's turned out a little bit. You don't want to turn it out too much, uh, although I have that one player who has it, that's his personal preference, he turns it out a lot. And if you do turn this back foot out a little bit like this, you don't want the front foot to be pointing forward. You don't want the feet splayed, if you will, like this, like a duck. You want to have the front foot parallel and this foot turned out a little bit. So just make sure if you decide to experiment with this back foot concept, that you don't have the front foot pointed in the other direction. That's a, that's a little bit strange um, in how and how to navigate that. Did the sharing, okay. Did you guys see that or did the sharing, did you not see my picture there? Yes, it's working. You saw me? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so we are gonna move on now. I've made the point that the focus here needs to be on getting the stance in order, getting it more organized, and using that back leg and that back foot as leverage to improve coil and turn that you're gonna see a lot of players lacking with. Actually, real quick, I'm gonna pull up, cause I got this right for this um, specific uh, presentation. I wanna show you my serve back in 97 before I knew any of this other than just copying Goron. Okay, so blurry clip of me serving against Chang. Uh, really blurry, but what I want you to notice is if you, I bring, I had a pinpoint stance, but when I bring the foot up, you'll notice that it's well behind the front foot. So this is the, if someone's going to do a pinpoint stance, it'll be the next video that's bigger, I think. Let's see this one here. Here we go. So this is different than the, the college player that I was showing you. Her foot was coming up more to the side. Mine is behind. So it's almost like a modified platform. This allows me to get massive turn. I had too deep of a knee bend there. I didn't have a great arm position there. Um, I mean, I'm just squatting tremendously, but I have got a, a really big turn and it's a function of the stance. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna shift gears and I wanna to move to the upper body. I wanna give you a serve hack or tip or tr trick that I think uh, you could use with all of your players or the players that actually want to change their serves. You and I all know that changing the serve is one of the most difficult things to do. And a lot of players don't wanna do it or don't wanna spend the time. But my feeling is, listen, as coaches, if we actually have a very clear progression, we can give that option and we can prescribe a plan to help them make these technical changes. And so what I want to do is bring up the upper body concepts here. So, so we're going to go back to the player here when he talked about not a lot of turn. So I want to start with a concept. This is with a paradigm shift. I think that player serves are getting out of whack because we're serving from a full motion. For whatever reason, when tennis was invented in 1860 or 1880, it started with a full motion, down together, up together, whatever you want to call it, that people have a really hard time going from that position to finding that amazing trophy position. Take this player right here. It takes a long time for him to find a trophy position. And he's really actually not turning. He's, he's really just moving his arm here. He's not, he's not really coiling or turning his shoulders. And so what we do with him and what we do with the other players is we, we put players in what I call the half serve. And you might have a version of it that you work with, but it's my feeling that until people learn how to turn properly with their shoulders, they should focus on uh, serving from a half serve position. So and I'm going to show you that example in a moment. Here's a guy. You might know his name. You might know him. Alexander Zarev. Okay, what? Three in the world, four in the world, but still double faulting sometimes 12 points a match. If you watch his motion, to me, it's technically flawed. So yes, he might have the yips, but as he re releases the ball, and I always look at what is happening with the racket and the shoulders when a player releases the ball. Are they, you don't have to turn your shoulders when you release the ball, but if you look at Federer and Sampras and others, they've already started their turn. 
A lot of players wait and they delay their turn. And I think that gets a lot of players into trouble. You can make it work, but if you look at Zarev, he's, re he's releasing the ball and this right shoulder is still to the right of his left shoulder. He's not turning. He he's released the ball. The ball is six feet in the air by now, eight feet in the air, 10 feet in the air. And he still hasn't turned his shoulders yet. He still hasn't coiled yet. And so I think this whole setup is throwing him off, especially, you know, when the pressure is high. Now he, he finds a nice turn eventually, but his toss also drops four to five feet. And so that was similar to the player that I just showed. Uh, Strong is his first name. Again, guy who played number one for his college team. He's not doing anything with his turn or his shoulders. And it all starting with the first six inches of the motion where he's just bringing his arms up instead of turning first. Again, I'm not here to say this is the way you have to do it. Just in my experience, I call it trimming the fat. This is, this is the simple way I think to serve is to get into a position, get your arm into a comfortable position as if you were throwing a ball as soon as possible instead of keeping the, the arm straight uh, for a long time. And so the half serve, uh, Let's see if I can show you. I really apologize that I have to keep sharing and unsharing. This was not my plan, but we're gonna make do here. There we go. So if you remember when I showed how he changed his stance, look at when he releases the ball. And again, this is extreme. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this. Uh, this may be two turn, but he hasn't released the ball and look at his turn. If we look at Fetter, if you go, after this presentation, if you go look at Federer, you'll see that his shoulders are already turning as he's releasing the ball, even before he's releasing the ball. He's finding, he's finding his turn. And his personal feedback, look how quickly and easily he finds his trophy position. And that's much different than the trophy position that he had three years ago. And it's different than Alexander Zarev's position. And I see this this is the patterns. I see this pattern over and over again. I'm going to show you another example. Um, we'll show you Rebecca again from a back view so you can look more at the upper body here. Back on her again, and you'll see that when she releases the ball, there's, there's no turn yet. She hasn't, she hasn't moved. And if anything, again, she's moving her arms because she's already bringing the rack, starting to bring the racket up. And yeah, she turns a little bit, but it's more of an up and down move instead of, instead of a true turn or coil. So her stance, her moving this foot up and the way that she moves at the beginning of the swing with her upper body is impacting her ability to serve well. Let's pay attention on this one. She's in her stance. She knows that I would like her to turn as she's tossing and look at her shoulder position as she tosses the ball. So just simple frameworks here, simple patterns, improve the stance and improve the first move. And notice, notice when we talk about this video analysis here, notice where is the racket, where are the shoulders when the ball is released and see if you can learn. There'll be variations on where the racket is. Some people will be low, some people will be medium, some people will be a little higher, but see if you can help players with their turn and their coil. This is probably, honestly, probably for your four fives and above, although I have players at the 4-0 level that are trying to reinvent, reinvent how they move at the beginning of their motion. I, go, I wanna show you the half serve and the three quarter serve. I knew I was leaving something out before going to the body. All right, so I would say two of my signature drills that I just uh, developed over time trying to help people with these positions is what I call the half serve drill and the three quarters drill. And so the half serve drill is really simple, but I'm really into the details. So if you can get the details right with some of the things that I'm talking about, then you can really get results. If you miss some of the deep details, it could be tricky. And the detail here is that when you think of the half serve, remember what I wanna teach at the beginning of the motion, I wanna teach turn. So if you notice where the ra racket is, can everyone see the, yeah, they can, you guys can see the screen, right? Yes. Awesome. So if you notice where the racket is, 
it's on the right side of the body for a right-hander. It is not, it is not behind the body. It is not, I'm not scratching the back. I am actually starting to the right side of the body so that when I toss the ball, what do my shoulders get to do? They get to turn. So this is a, this is a, a trick or a, or a tip or, or a reinforcement pattern that I want them to, I want to eliminate the full motion. I want to eliminate either any down together, up together with the arms. I want to get it in, the, in a position that is biomechanically correct for throwing a ball. So when you do this, you also don't want your arm too far away from you. You want it v relaxed at about a 90 degree angle, maybe a little less than 90 as if you're going to throw a ball. And when you toss the ball, all you're going to do is turn. And so if you look here, that's all I'm focusing on right there. I want to find that position every time. So right there, I find a, a very efficient trophy position with a simple move. And this is where I think the paradigm shift is. I would love someday, and this is just me being, you know, the mad scientist over here in Denver, probably, you know, too much high altitude, but I think that everyone should just serve in a half serve until they learn this. Like if we just had a mandate in tennis that you, ju you just, you, this, before you can pass go, you learn how to turn. You just don't worry about the full motion. Don't worry about what's happening on TV. Get this, this motion right. This gets into progressions now. So a paradigm shift to fix a, pa a faulty pattern to move into uh, pro uh, progressions. So once this gets solid and, and natural, guess what we get to do next? We get to progress and move the racket uh, down further to what I call the three quarters drill. Now, this is an interesting one because with the three quarters drill, all I'm doing is I'm starting this and players have a hard time with this. I'm starting with the racket by my back leg here. It's just hanging relaxed like this. And so what that allows you to do is all you have to do is when you toss the ball, you can start moving your arm into the trophy position. So the, you can see, I'm just kind of scrolling here. Yeah. So right. We'll get me a ball here. Here we go. Right. So you see where the racket is. I'm not in the full motion. Players are going to want to, they're going to want to connect their, the tennis ball to the racket. You want to focus on just simply bringing the racket to that position right there. So you've worked on the half serve. You're getting comfortable. Now you just start moving the arm down and then you just try to find that position. Things are going to go south when you put people back into a full motion position. So again, if I can help players get to this position easier, then I think over time they can develop a better serve. So the, the half serve and the three quarters, when we look at the upper body, how to work on the racket position, I feel those are two simple exercises uh, that can help people feel where they need to get in this all important trophy position before they load up and, and, and go up to the ball. Next up, what I want to do is I want to focus on the body. And so the questions I asked were, what is the lower body doing? And how does the stance impact it? What is the upper body doing? And how are the arms and the shoulders being impacted by what players are focusing on? And the third is what is the body doing or can the body actually do it? And what I find is that a lot of players physically cannot get into the positions that I'm demonstrating that Roger Federer can do that Pete Sampras can do. And so this is where that racket fit body serve connection comes in this holistic perspective. And what I want to do is I want to show a couple of examples of players, uh, some, some things that I see and how there's some limitations in the body. So again, it would be easier if I could show a before and after, but we've talked about Becca here who has improved her stance. She's improved her first move. She's, she's serving better than she ever has. What I want you to pay attention to is something that I call bowing. And essentially when she's going up to the ball right here, if you were to draw a line through her body, it's pretty from her, let's say from her nose straight through her spine, it's pretty straight right? If you can see that, it's pretty straight up and down. So I've given her, I think I've given her a good first move, good, pretty good trophy position, pretty good stance. At this point, I've probably improved her technique to uh, like the 95, 97, 99 percentile. 
What's going to happen next is if she wants to play on the tour, she's going to have to upgrade her body. And so again, whether there, she's going to be a pro, whether you're dealing with 3.5s or 4.0s, if they're older, they are going to have limitations. And so I want to pull up a video of me, um, the old man here. Uh, last summer, last summer, if you can see this, I was in Atlanta at a personal development conference. It just so happened the Atlanta tournament was there. And I'm friends with Mike and Bob Bryan. I decided to go watch play. I went early because they were warming up. And, and all of a sudden, I'm, you know, Bob Bryan is saying, I need a lefty to serve to me. And they call me out like cold. I'm not even wearing tennis gear. And I just go to no man's land to serve. But I want you to pay attention to if I were to draw, you know, a line straight down like this, my body doesn't go through that line. I have, I have a, the backside of my body is, is arching or bowed. And so the player, Becca, can't get into this position yet. Uh, we have a great physical therapist locally that understands what I'm trying to do, and he's amazing, and he's trying to help her create that. So most people are really tight in the rib cage, in the thoracic spine, in the thorax. That's the mid spine. A lot of people have breathing issues, slumped shoulders, sitting at their desk all day. They can't open up their chest. And so until she can get this position, she's going to lose power and the ability to make the ball jump and do all types of great things with her serve. And so even though her technique has improved dramatically, we still have work to do on the body. And so that's an example, this bowing concept, you're going to see that with a lot of your players that they're not going to be able to do it, that they're going to be more straight up and down when they serve. Now I'm going to pull up another example of a club player who is a member of my site. And again, this is a guy that I've never met before. I've done one video analysis with him, but he's super driven, super motivated. I think he was a 3.5. Now he's moving towards a 4.5, uh, but he's improved his turn. So he's got a nice, pretty nice stance. He could slide this foot back a little bit more. He doesn't really turn as much as he could, but look at, first of all, look at his low back. See the curve right there in the spine? That is a, that is a uh, spine issue in terms of mobility and also possibly a hip issue. And so he doesn't understand how to use his pelvis correctly. And you'll see this. You'll see this. We call it an S posture in racket fit. You'll see this early and often with players that they don't know how to get into the right positions. And so you have to help players give them positioning drills without hitting balls where they hold certain positions with a racket, without a racket, so that they can use their spine and their pelvis in a more efficient way. And I see this a lot with kids. Uh, again, tight hip flexors, uh, tight uh, rib cage, they're, they're gonna compensate. And uh, you're gonna see this all over the place. And the point that I wanna make again is that we can fixate on technique as coaches, but you have to understand that the tech, their players are creating their technique, oftentimes working around their body limitations. And so look at, look at it from that point of view. How can I learn how to help them improve their body or how can I help them find, find a physical therapist or a trainer that understands these components? Uh, let's see, where do I wanna go next? So we talked about that. Oh, I'm gonna show you one more thing. So we just showed you the S posture right here, okay? As he goes up to serve, you'll also see he actually has pretty good, pretty good bowing. You can see he can, he can bow, but he's already really opening up as he hits the serve. So what he needs to work on is really improving the position of his pelvis as he gets to this position and improving his coil and his turn. There's probably some restriction, again, in his spinal rotation, and his ability to use his hips. And so that's that issue. We, we mentioned the Boeing with Becca. I want to show you one more example, and then I'll jump back to the PowerPoint real quick. So this, I want you to look at the lower body, particularly the knees. And this is a side view of Becca here. And I want you to pay attention to, again, she's in a nice stance. Nice rhythm right there. Now watch the back knee. See how it collapses in like that? You'll see that a lot with a high performance player when they really jump. That knee is, is we call it a collapsed knee. It's collapsing in. That's probably a right ankle restriction or a, or a, a hip mobility issue. And so she's got to repattern this to be able to drive off of her back leg. This is not something you can correct 
when you uh, are helping someone with their technique. This is something that has to be changed off the court with somebody's body. And so if she's, if she's collapsing in like this, that means that something else is going to have to do more work. Maybe her spine, maybe her low back, maybe her hip, maybe her shoulder. So you really want to set the foundation and see if you can improve those areas. I'm going to show you an example of how I do it. Keep in mind, I look, I've worked over the years a lot on my ankle mobility and stability, but you'll see the stance there. It's a right-handed version of me. Don't worry, I'm not right-handed. We just flipped the video. But you can see when I go to drive up, that knee is staying over the toe here. I, I keep the space between the knees here. So I must have the stability to be able to hold that position. And so that, those are the little things when you start getting into these upper levels that you can uh, really make a difference in a player. We still haven't licked this thing with Becca yet. So I'm not saying this, these are easy things to change. And I'm not saying you should go out and try to change this tomorrow. But my whole goal today is to create a paradigm shift, to look at the serve a different way than maybe you've considered before. So now what I'll do is I'll just finish up with the PowerPoint here. And I'll take questions when we, when we finish up. We'll kind of just wrap things up here. All right, so as I've been talking about, the three Ps, patterns. I've seen many patterns over the years that are consistent. And fortunately, with Racket Fit, I've learned even more about how the patterns show up with the body. But I've seen patterns consistently with serve technique. I've seen where players can't find certain positions. We talked about when a player releases the ball, where should their, what, body, what position should their body in? We've talked about when they're loading up, what should it look like in the trophy position? And then progressions, being able to progress someone in a, in a way where they can get those wins, where they can improve their half serve position or their three quarter serve position, improving progressions before skipping steps and having them, you know, serve the way they've always served and, and also try to change technique. Now the caveat here is if someone's competing, I have them use their regular motion when they compete, but when they're away from the court, they work when they're away from competition, they work on their technique. So it's, it's kind of a, a, it's not like you pull them away for competition, pull them away from competition for, for months. You have to work with their competitive skills as well. So I never ask players to just change their technique and go compete with it. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a flowing process, if you will. Remember what I said in the beginning, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so I hope that, if I said one thing today might have changed the way that you look at the serve and how you might consider teaching the serve and that you also consider, wow, if I start using my iPhone more and taking videos and looking at these, some of the positions that I showed you today and understand how you can start to give players specific drills instead of just telling them, uh, you know, keep your head up, toss the ball higher or lower, that we actually systematically break it down, then I think this blended learning concept of using video, getting on court, using videos from your own website or an online instructor's website to actually facilitate the learning, then players are going to start serving better. So with that being said, I want to give you all, I got a free gift for you today. Uh, forgot to mention that at the beginning, but if you go to this URL right here, it's tennisevolution.com backslash four inch move. I've got a little mini course and it will also include four corrective exercises that I uh, have from Brad Ott, who's the physical therapist I mentioned earlier. He's an absolute genius. We've worked together. And these are exercises that really teach you how to load the legs, how to get the pelvis in a better position. And those are all inside my Tennis Evolution app. So you'll get the course and you'll get those corrective exercises. We're not course, seeing your PowerPoint screen, Jeff. Oh, so no. We're only seeing you right now. Here, we'll just do it. I'm just going to fly through it so you can see it. So we, had, so we had patterns, positions, and progressions. We had the quote, if you change the way you look at things, the way you look at, uh, the way you look at things change. This blended learning concept, start to use video to enhance your ability to help your students. And uh, we, we have an app um, at Tennis Evolution now that's been a game changer to get people to use the app and look at their video analysis. And like I said, I've got this link for you uh, tennisevolution.com four inch move opt in absolutely free. I'm giving you a free course. It's my four inch swivel move lesson plus 
uh, two, uh, two bonus lessons in there. It's a mindset lesson and also a target lesson. So how people can aim to targets better and how they can um, think more proactively when they serve so they can stay out of slumps. And I'd mentioned the corrective exercises. Uh, as always, if you want to connect with me, you can text me at 303-882-9028. My email is jeff at tennisevolution.com. My website is www tennisevolution.com. And like I said, if you want to get that free course, you can go ahead and get it. And with that being said, uh, thanks for your patience as I jumped all around with the case studies, uh, did the best I could with what, with what I had today. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I'm, I'm here to answer questions. Jeff, you were amazing getting through this because I know it was difficult. And thank you. It might have been different had you been the originating host as a, instead of a co-host. That's okay. So uh, my first question, there are some people that have some questions, but I, mm -hmm. I want to ask without, without letting you get too uh, advertorial about it, uh, kind of explain to the pros on, the, on this that how tennis evolution might benefit us as teaching pros. I know that these pieces that you've just talked about are on your site, and I know you have a lot of players that use it, but how is it also advantageous to coaches? Oh, I mean, I, obviously I'm biased. But, um, you know, I, I feel, and we already have coaches that do this, um, you know, they're, they're, you're going to have diehards, you're going to have people that, that look at, um, you know, they're looking at everybody online to see what works for them. But, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I've spent my life's work trying to figure this whole thing out. And, you know, I came from Denver, Colorado. I was never supposed to be a pro. I didn't go to an academy. I went to a public high school. I wasn't groomed. Uh, my dream was to go to Stanford. And so I just went on this journey as a pro because I wasn't getting answers. And uh, as a coach, the last decade, I've been obsessed with um, how to make tennis easier and more fun to learn. And, and I think I'm on the right track because I get a lot of feedback from people, even on YouTube, who I've never met before. They're like, best kick serve video I've ever seen. And, you know, again, I say that uh, with full gratitude and humility that it, it means a lot that I can make a difference. And so when it comes to a coach, if you're on, this is what I would do if I was on a coach, if I don't have an answer and I didn't have the answers with the serve when I first started coaching here, I had this 125 mile an hour serve, 130 mile an hour serve, but I didn't feel confident teaching the serve when I became coach, began coaching in 2008. So if I were, and I went on a search and I started asking coaches, I would say, Hey, if I don't feel comfortable teaching the serve or the forehand or the backhand, I would just try out tennis evolution or try out another website. Again, I'm not here to pitch myself other than I think that if you resonate with the way that I teach and my philosophy, it can't hurt to study some of my serve stuff, whether it's on YouTube for free or whether it's in my courses and then go out and play with the lab rats, your, your clients and play with it and see what works and doesn't work. And that's how I, if I were a coach and I wanted to learn the serve and, and anything else, I would tap into the courses that I have and the membership that I have. And again, if you're more interested, obviously you can follow up with me and I'll guide you. But again, the whole goal is it's not about just selling my stuff. It's actually in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I would love to be a part of the paradigm shift that actually grows the game because we know the game is not, I don't think the game is growing and the stats that I'm seeing and we were the tennis is a hard sport to learn, but what I've, what I've, and I know this is a long, long-winded answer, but I'm on the soapbox now. If I, I've seen a number of cases, one Becca, the one that I know, she went to two colleges and was ready to quit tennis. And we've spent time together in the summers. And now she's going to try to play the pro tour. She went from a player who wanted to quit to loving the game more than anything. And it's because she's getting better. That's all. So if we can help players get better, and if my videos help you help your players get better. That's what I'm here for. That's what I, that's what I believe in. So that's my long winded answer to that one. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there's quite a few people that have asked a little bit more uh, detail possibly on the pinpoint versus the platform. And I, I know you said you didn't necessarily have one, but they said, how would you choose where to put the people and, and you know, kind of how you work through that? Yes. So with the pinpoint stance, it's a great question. So I have theories about the serve, like the full motion, how it throws people off that we actually should just, Jay Berger was one of your speakers. Jay Berger used to have a half serve. 
I think maybe because he had shoulder issues, but I would put everybody in the Jay Berger half motion and help him with that. The same thing with the stances. I would put everyone in a platform stance until they get this stuff, the upper body to improve, the coil to improve. And then if they want to move their back foot up later, they can. But what I find is that when people add in moving the back foot, it can impact turn, it can impact load, it can impact coil. And then you're, you're, you have an extra variable. You have more moving parts. So I like to start with that solid base, whether it's a wide platform or a narrow platform. And then we work, then once we get that solidified, then we can move the back foot. What ends up happening with the players I work with is they get so comfortable in the platform, they don't want to move. I believe people go to a platform stance. We see this over and over again in racket, but they can't load their back foot. So if you can't load your back leg or your back foot for whatever reason, then you're going to feel more comfortable moving your back foot up. And that would be a reason why you would keep someone in a pinpoint early instead of following what I just said. If you see that they cannot load their back leg and jump, you could say, you know what, we should just do a pinpoint, but make sure I think you should do a pinpoint where it comes behind the front foot and not up to the side. And Uh, The final thing I'll say is if someone can't load their back leg for a platform, where I go is I give them the corrective exercises to learn how to load their back foot. And granted, I'm working with high performance here. I'm working with college and pro players, the examples that I showed you. Um, But if I were working with four O's every day, I would do the same thing. I would give them homework. I would give them corrective exercises and I would teach them how to load their back leg. And then they can decide later if they want to move it. Well, that's good, Jeff. And I, and I know the, the players that aren't as, as high of a level aspire to be that, and they want to work like the pros, and that's why they come to you for, uh, and to your site so that they can learn this. Um, that's right. We have one other question, and it was talking about uh, working through with the more league-level players about the complications that they have on the toss. Yeah. And do you have something that you're – it's a simpli- simplicit, a very simple way of uh, – coaching the tolls. Yeah. So I can answer that in a general way, but is there more specifics about the toss? Are we talking about uh, left, right, forward, back, high, low, uh, uh, wayward, uh, all of it? Um, Is there anything specific or should I just... Just said that the players that mostly have problems with the tolls, how do we teach it to make it more simple and not so complicated for them? Sure. So... uh, Hold on a second. One, 20 seconds. So, so what I would say to that, this is how I look at the toss. If you follow the framework that I'm kind of te- that I'm teaching here with the video analysis and the techniques, when someone comes to me and say, I struggle with my toss, invariably their motion is jacked up too. They don't have a great service motion. So if someone wants to go through the process, I say, I'll tell you what, if you improve your technique, I believe your toss is actually going to get better because of it. Oftentimes, because if you look at Alexander Zarev, what are they, what everyone says he's got too high of a toss. So they might say, well, lower the toss. But I actually think it's the issues that I showed where he doesn't turn and get into the trophy right away. That is messing up the height of his toss. So, I usually get people to improve their technique and their foundation and the toss can solve itself in some cases. Now, with that being said, um, again, a lot of you might teach this already, but I think if you can practice holding it, you know, in your fingertips more, a lot of people are in their hand, but in their fingertips. And when they release the ball, they need to feel like it's coming from the shoulder and they need to see if they can toss the ball with no spin like a knuckleball. And that's very difficult for people to do. Um, but again, a lot of times I'm focusing on helping someone with their technique first, hoping that they can get the toss later. If you're in a pinch and you know, they're not going to change their technique, then like I said, I would get it in the fingertips. I get them to try to practice, um, tossing from the shoulder more. And the tough thing about the answer I'm giving you here is I'm a situational coach. So if I saw an example, I could say, well, this is what you do here. Or if I see another example, this is what you might want to try here. Uh, but I think a lot of people really move their arm too fast or it's bent 
Um, so if they can learn to just raise the shoulder like this and keep it more in the fingertips, one last thing I'll say is I have a lesson somewhere on my website where if you actually hold it with three fingers, not, not when you actually play, but as a drill, now you're kind of getting all the fingers out of play and you're learning again, just to release it, uh, release it with the fingers with the, those couple fingers there where it's, it's more of like a gentle release instead of kind of throwing it up with the, with the hand. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. I mean, that was absolutely terrific. Uh, easy to understand approach. Uh, I think it's great. Thank you. Appreciate it.